The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you. All right, you guys ready to get started? Oh my God, a blue screen of death. Now that is embarrassing. I'm here at oh, Southeast Linux Fest and I just got caught with this. If I only had my high performance kernel patch running on my system, this would have never happened. Don't let it happen to you. Okay, that's the end of that. That's icebreaker right there. <laughs> It's always funny, right? You can't get away from that. All right, so ICC. Has anybody in here used ICC? Cool. You guys know the new name for ICC? It's called XE now. It's called Composer XE or Compiler XE. Because when you use ICC, you're not just creating. No, never mind. That's <laughs> All right, let's see. So my slides work, what are the possibilities? There we go. All right, so obviously one of the big reasons that everybody uses ICC is extreme performance. Um, there's always, you know, a big competition between GCC and ICC, it's very close. But ICC in a lot of situations, it's just a little bit faster. Some people that's not worth it, you know. Um, there is a lot of work you know, creating an ICC kernel. Um, if I was Steve Jobs, I might come up here and say, you know, it's easy to use and it just works. That's not what we got going on here. You got to put in some time. Um, your compile is not going to happen the first time. There's going to be some stuff, some quirks, because everybody's configuration is different. Everybody is building their kernel a little bit different. So that kind of thing um, just has to be accounted for. Um, but once you get it built, you know, it is faster, it's better, it's an accomplishment. So it, it's a project for hackers, um, people who are interested in getting things working that are um, a little bit difficult. So if you're the kind of guy who likes to take on a challenge, this is the project for you. You'll learn a lot and you'll learn a new uh, skill, you'll learn a new compiler. Um, diversification, we can find bugs real easy. With ICC, we'll get into that, why we find interesting things. Um, and freedom, um, really it gives, well, up until about a couple months ago, it really gives freedom where there isn't any, or there's very little. In other words, there's a little bit of a monopoly. Richard Stallman isn't in here, he's not gonna kill me, is he? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah it, it's, um, it's something that gives competition, and competition is good. I mean, you know, you can't play tennis without somebody else, and you usually get better when you have somebody to play against. So um, there's that. Um, there's some other guys out there that have got kernels running. Um, Solaris, their compiler suite. Supposedly, I haven't seen it, can't find any patches, but they've built a kernel is what they're saying. They built a Linux kernel. Clang. Um, which is the BSD group, uh, evidently has done this. And there's some other smaller compilers out there that have done that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that's great because I think that that takes the code that we have and makes it better because you can find bugs that you normally can't find. Um, it's the diversification of the code, if you will. Um, also, uh, regarding freedom, ICC, I don't know about the other compilers because I haven't really gotten into them as much. They, um, ICC that is, has some flags that have been incorporated in older patches that kind of give you another dimension, another extra part of the fact that Linux is free and that you can do with it what you want. 
Um, we'll, we'll get into that. It really has to do with PGO, profile guided optimization, and what you can do with that. Um, you know, if you're compiling something to make it faster, you're usually uh, considering your architecture. You've got a P4 system, and you create the flags, and then you recompile it. Well, that makes your system faster, right? Which is gonna help you out. But what about how you use your system? Is there a way to custom tailor it even more so it reflects your usage patterns? And so that's something that our patch set has the possibility of doing. So how did it all start? It started very humbly on Gentoo forums. A lot of Gentoo users in here, anybody? Cool. So, you know, when you first start Gentoo, all that code is awesome. It looks like the matrix, you know, you're compiling stuff and you're hoping it works. And when it does, it's like, yes. But it can get a little old. It can get a little pedantic, right? So, I mean, after a while, you're starting to think, well, what can I do to snazz this up? I was reading up on ICC. I was like, ooh, this is interesting. Oh, it's faster. I got to try this. It's free. Ooh, yes. So I downloaded it. I emerged it. Um, the emerge out there, I should say right now, is really old. Don't do it. We've got an e-build that'll give you something a little bit, a, a lot better than what it originally had out there. Um, but um, that was the reason. It was, it, was, it was something else to do. It was faster. I started messing around with it. I started compiling things like Python, like Perl. You know, I was seeing good performance increases with these uh, applications, and I thought to myself, well, why not the kernel? Why not, why not go after, try to bag the elephant? And you know, I went out on Google, it was a little crazy, and I thought, you know, maybe there's somebody as crazy as me. Maybe somebody out there has tried this. And sure enough, this guy right here, um, Ingo A. Kublin, I'm not sure if I pronounce his name ever right, he's German. But um, he had some really mad scientist level patches out there that um, I, I'd like to see him back on the project because he's just an amazing individual. And the things that he did with his, his kernel sets, which were basically through 264 to 269. And these had all the bells and whistles that I'll be talking about. Um, there have been some hardware architectural changes that have made it harder. Well, of course, the software you know changes all the time, but there's been some um, basic inherent changes to the Intel and AMP um, architectures that have made it a little bit harder to do um, what you could do with these patches. They don't they don't work even if we could get them to the point um, where everything the code works compiles normally. Um, all the other stuff, um, the PGO and the other flags, don't work correctly. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of debugging. Um, I've had a guy working on it, working on it, working on it. He can't get it to work. So, um, if you guys are interested, know anybody who is interested, this is something that is going to create a patch set that's going to be faster than anything out there. It's a specific uh, purpose patch set, um, is how it does it. Custom tailors your kernel for whatever the usage is. So, it takes it a little bit step a step further from what you would consider a regular Gen 2 build on how it does things. Um, our first proof of concept was 2622. 2623 and above had some code that would not compile. We ran into some big errors, and so we just kind of gave up on that, and we found out that 262 had not implemented those yet. So um, at this point, I was on the Intel forums, and I was working with one of the guys that I work with still today, a guy named Feilong Wong. Uh, Long, he is out of Singapore, um, excuse me, Shanghai, China. Him and a guy named Liu Yi Ching, um, who does not work for Intel. But these two guys, I started working with them on the forums, and this it got a lot of attention. I don't know how many hits it did, but everybody wanted this thing to work. And Liu Yi just, you know, we were, me and Fei Long were just trying everything. We we're starting to rewrite ASM code and all sorts of crazy stuff to try to get it to work, and uh, that wasn't helping out. So. He just came in and he just added this line. He said, well, what about this? And we're like, okay, so we'll try it. Why not? Nothing else is working. We did a make, we had a kernel. So we were like, wow, this is something. And that got me really excited because I was like, this actually works. You know, this is something that the community could use. They could use access to these patch sets. 
So that's basically the first patch that ever hit our, our mirror that I set up. All right, so I already talked about Liu Yiqing. He's head of development. He's in Shanghai, China. Um, I have to work with him at night because he's on the other side of the planet. And I did that for two years. Um, he's been hard to get in touch with right now because I just took a very full-time position with LexisNexis. So I hate to say that I've uh, not given the attention that I usually do for this project, but um, I want to see it do good. And that's you know why I'm here today, to make sure that it keeps producing patches and that kind of thing. But yeah, he's a go-to guy. I mean, I'll get to the point. I'm nowhere near this guy's level. You know, I'll get to the point where oh, I've tried this, I tried this, it's not working. I've gone to the make file, I've changed the flags, still not compiling, and he'll come back. Yeah, what about this? I'm like, okay, let's try it, and then it works. He gets all sorts of stuff to compile that I didn't think to compile. People come back and say, well, you know, you can't do X work. It's not, you can't compile it. Oh, we've tried OpenSSL. You can't compile it. And then I tell that to him. I say, you know, we got some problems if we want to do a holistic system. These are not going to compile. And he comes back. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, got it to work. I'm like, really? Yeah. It's like, okay, I just did no GCC with OpenSSL and got it to compile. And voila, you got better performance. And I was like, okay, well, there, I X that one off. And so it, it's got to the point where we get a lot of, of pretty much everything except for a few things out there like GCC, go figure, it doesn't want to compile with ICC. Yeah, so I'll have to talk to Mr. Stallman about that. So. Um, so we still have some other members. Uh, Alex Humer, he is in Austria and he is always there. Um, everybody in the project just kind of comes and goes, but when they have something that they want, add it in. Um, well, usually it's Alex. He's always talking about wanting to get some IRC stuff going on. So uh, that's always, he's always hammering me about that. So we're going to try to get that going. I met Alex in the Gen2 forums. He was one of the guys that was kind of there like, yeah, you're crazy, but it might work. You know, and I was like, okay, that's good. That's good to hear. Um, so he was moral support there. And then, you know, I got to everybody else and told them, we got it working. Do that. Um, this is Hassan. Uh, he is a web dev. I have Drupal here, but he does all sorts of stuff. And uh, he is working on the community. Right now, really, all we have is a Google group and a mirror. Um, and it's very stripped down because I just don't have time to make something fancy. You know? And if you're using Gentoo, you're probably using links or wget to get your files anyway. You really don't care. So I've just left it at that. <laughs> So he's going to come in, and he's going to make a uh, community, um, either, either a repository, everything that a good project should have. So handing off the reins to that, let him do that. The next guy does not like to give out his name. He just goes by Dark Basic. Um, <laughs> he, he created a great e-build, um, a 64-bit e-build that will um, install both 32-bit and 64-bit parts into Gentoo so it'll compile correctly. Um, that was with 10.1.72 at the latest. And now, uh, this week, I wanted to bring in a stage and a virtual machine for people to play around with, and it doesn't work. There's some, been some changes, and I've been beating my head up against the wall. Unfortunately, guys, I'm sorry. I don't have that for you. Hopefully, we'll have that soon. Because that's really the best way to experiment with Gentoo. It gives you all your flags. It, you know, you can put them down, and you can just do merge e world and see what compiles and whatnot. And you can get a pretty fast system in that way, marketably faster than if you had just done it with GCC. Um, some of the advanced flags don't always compile. Don't expect them to. Um, you might want to go on a flag by flag basis and, uh, with Portage for that kind of thing. But we've got, we've got stuff out there, we've got information, and we'll be putting that into the community to let everybody know what's compiling, what's not, what are the best flags, what are you gonna get the best performance out of, you know. Um, good things to, off the bat, good things to uh, compile are 
Python. If you're a Python programmer and you want it to get to the point where it's unoptimized C-like, which is, you know, that's the golden grail for a lot of Python developers, try ICC. I think you'll be happy with the results. Perl, that's another one that's going to give you better results. You know, there's a whole bunch of them out there that's on the Gen 2 wiki. We have some of them on our uh, mirror. But, um, yeah, worth a shot, I think. Uh, I should mention that ICC is free. You do have to have a license. It is free for individuals. Now, if you're a corporation with money, yeah, they want, they want money for that. So it is closed source, open source. They don't want you doing some stuff to the um, compiler uh, in certain situations. So, but for what it's intended for, it's absolutely free for you guys to go out there and experiment with. I suggest it. I think you'll find it fun. If you like compiling, you like Gentoo. Something that will open your eyes a bit. Um, bringing on that subject a little bit more, is our kernel non-GPL? No. Uh, it will work without XE installed. Uh, Composer XE, ICC is free for your personal usage. And our patches that we give out are GPL 2.0 code, and that's why we put them back in the community. We want to make sure that everybody sees the changes that we've made and has that available. Um, so some of these are successes, some of them not so much. Um, the first, fast and easy to make, pretty much a success. We have changes in how we do compiling. Um, we kind of need to streamline that so we have it more into, um, we decide one method or the other. Right now we have several methods and it kind of changes depending on who is heading up creating the, the patch. You know, if it's Intel, they do it one way. If it's the community, they kind of try to get everything in the patch so it's create the patch and then you don't have anything in between ICC to create the, the uh, kernel. Um, we have a deal with SGI. They've given us an Altic supercomputer um, to get the Itanium chip uh, compiled with it. And the reason for that um, is that uh, Itanium chips are kind of intimately linked to the compiler. They rely a little bit more on what the compiler can give them for their performance. And they generally are faster. You know, Itanium doesn't always get a lot of um, fanfare. You shouldn't ever name your, you know, your CPU after something that sounds like the Titanic. It's not gonna, it's just not gonna work, right? You know, it doesn't matter how good it is. It's, forget about it. Um, the Moblem project um, was something that Max Domica of Intel, he's out in Oregon, uh, wanted uh, us to do. Um, Max is in embedded space. He does a lot of Atom uh, uh, kind of development. Uh, great guy. Um, unfortunately, right now our resources, we're not at the point where we have the time to be able to create those repos. Um, there's some other stuff out there that we have to do uh, to get that. We get tangled up a little bit in legalities because well, you can't really redistribute that compiler with your code, right? Because that's closed source. So they don't want you to do that. What they do is they give you the libs. You've got redistributable libs. Well, that's nice, but we're redistributing RPMs. So we've got to make an RPM out of that and get that. And that's kind of a tangled mess. And, you know, that's something that we've talked to Intel about. So if we can get that hammered out and we can find somebody who's willing to do those um, RPMs, that's the kind of thing that we'd like to get going. Um, but right now, the focus is on making the patches. You know, that's, that's the main thing because that's what people are after is the extra speed that they're going to be able to get from our patches. So the vision, the why we do, the craziness behind it. Um, general PC computing. You know, general purpose uh, computing uh, versus specific purchase, uh, purpose computing. Um, general purpose computing is basically what you buy when you go to Micro Center or Walmart and you pick up a box and you've got Windows 7 on there. 
you know, it's installed, but it's kind of like, yeah, uh, I'm here. What, what do you want me to use? What, do you, what am I? What am I for? I'm not optimized really, um, but you know, I can run anything. Specific purpose computing is more for the server segment. It's for things that do one purpose. You've got a web server out there. You've got a database out there. Well, you're not going to be surfing the web on that. You're not going to be doing other stuff like that. So it's taken and all that stuff is swept away and it's optimized for what you use it for. Um, there are a lot of big companies like IBM that are investing in getting the hardware and the software to the state where it is an appliance that does what it does. It's secure, it's fast, and that's its purpose. Um, deployment may be a little bit more of a pain because right now you can just take a general purpose box, throw whatever on it, and it'll do what you want, but then you've got all this other stuff out there. It's taking up CPU, it's taking up memory, it's taking up you know, everything else, hard drives. And you know, there's security risks involved with that. The code is unoptimized. I mean, it's, it's quick and dirty, but I mean, if you get to the point where you want something a little bit more polished, you want to save some money, uh, I think it's worth the time and effort to get something that's going to you know, get the job done faster with less electricity. You know? So that's why we think this is a good idea for the enterprise. Um, argument there a lot of times is that you know, well, is it worth the time that you put your, your sysadmin, you know, to compile all this code and get it running? Well, I mean, you compile it on one system, and if you've got a cluster, you move it to all the other boxes. So, I mean, right there, that's one install versus a million kickstarts or whatever. Um, and then you've got a system that's a lot faster. So, you know, it's going to save money and time as far as I'm concerned. Um, so there are examples, low-level examples, um, hardware, risk CPU for networking. Um, it's a big Indian ship, usually, um, and so network packets are in big Indian. So there's less translation that has to go on there. So that's something that um, makes things faster because it's optimized for what it's using for. A lot of network appliances are all risk, and that's one of the reasons behind that. Um, for software, obviously you hear me talk about Gen 2 Linux a lot, the ability to compile a system for a specific platform, streamline the software for the specific purpose, uh, and create web appliances for those specific purposes. Um, we're ready to take both of these and evolve them to the next level. Um, like I was saying, optimized code executes faster, takes less time on the same hardware. Um, so if you want to save money, you know, hardware is expensive, you might want to think about just doing a little bit of reconfiguration to your systems instead of going out and forking out money, especially in the situation that we're in uh, with the economy. So why else move from monolithic OSs? I think this is the best example that I've come across. So Windows has 50 million lines of code, not including applications like Office. It's a gigantic monolithic style operating system ready for anything. So um, I think it was Phoenix BIOS that was doing some stuff where they were trying to make instant on BIOS and they were trying to calculate the time and they were trying to figure out well, why the hell does it take this long for Windows to load? And they started thinking about all the calculations and they came up with 20 billion CPU operations just to get to the lock on screen, which is um, that's pretty ridiculous if you think about it. I'm not sure what's going on there, but a lot of that I think can be kind of cut out and streamlined a little bit, you know. Um, which, you know, is, is why solid state drives are such a good idea for uh, Windows boxes because, you know, it cuts down on that. Yeah, I should mention that ICC is a fast kernel set, but if you're expecting it to be faster than a hardware solution like a solid state drive or uh, GPU computing, no, it's not going to do that. It's not at the point. ICC does have plugins for, uh, uh, what is it, uh, CUDA so that you can, you can commingle those uh, APIs and get some faster execution out of your code. So that's something that's good. Fifty million lines of code. Well, you think usually somewhere between 12 to 6 million lines of code for the kernel. 
Um, and, and that obviously depends on your kernel, how it's configured and everything like that. I'm guessing that would be something like a Red Hat system. But that's the numbers. Somewhere between there is what I always see for that. So that's a lot slimmed down. And then, you know, your service processes are usually a little bit slimmed down. If it's a server, you know, it doesn't have to load an, uh, a GUI and all that kind of stuff, which Windows is going to load anyway in that kind of situation. So, and, you know, that's one of the reasons that you don't see a whole lot of Windows boxes on supercomputers is because, well, I mean, there's all this extra code taking up space. It's pretty much pointless. I think a lot of what they've done with... Uh, uh, the compute clusters that they do now kind of take out a lot of that, but still, I mean, if you need a fast box and you don't have a supercomputer, you know, you, you just got to go to Linux. There's really no choice, you know. You're not going to be able to take the code and say, oh, this is nice. Now, I don't need this. I don't need that. I can take it out of the kernel, and now I can recompile it, and now it's faster because all this other crap is out of the way, and I don't need it. So, um, you're not going to be able to do that with Windows unless you want to go to jail. And, you know, you know I don't want to do that. I want to learn more about my system. <laughs> so, yeah, a few years ago, uh, Linus came out and he was just kind of like, you know what? Our kernel is getting a little bit big. And, I mean, this is across the board. I mean, every kernel these days is getting huge. You keep adding stuff that we want it to do, and eventually it's just gigantic, and it has no real specific purpose. This is the problem with general purpose computing, is that your, your box has to be ready for anything because it's just code, it's ready to be deployed, it's fast, it's updatable real quick, but it doesn't really know what it's doing. It's a little bit schizophrenic doesn't know what's going on. Um, so, yeah, spork-like in nature is the best uh, analogy I could come up with. Um, you know, it's it, the kernel itself is C and in, inline assembly code where it needs it, um, but maybe that could be better. Maybe that could be more optimized. Um, hardware abstraction, you know, that's another thing. Uh, they want it to be able to be on any chip out there. And that's a good thing about GCC. By the way, I should say I'm not a GCC basher. I love GCC and everything that it does. It's always just on the edges of ICC when it comes to performance, sometimes better. So um, it is a great, uh, you know, it, it, it'll take the code and put it on pretty much any chip out there. You know, if, if GCC gives you um, will it run Linux, ICC is will it run Linux fast, you know, and it doesn't do that on every chip. It does it on Intel chips and AMD chips, but um, that's its purpose is to be a fast compiler. So, right, I think we already went over this backwards compatibility, and yeah, that's always fun. Uh, if you're compiling uh, an ICC kernel and you have an old 8-track cassette set that you want to use your backups for, yeah, you might have problems compiling that code. We'll get into why later. But, um, yeah, that, that's an issue. But that's an issue with uh, monolithic uh, operating systems as well. So just an example, um, in a server scenario, I see it a lot where I work, is that we'll have a TCP offloading engine. It's a NIC card that does firewall, it does hardware, uh, offload of a network stack and stuff like that. Well, that code in the kernel is very CPU, uh, it takes a lot of CPU time. Um, if it's not being used, recompile your kernel. You don't need that. Brush it aside, have the toad card do it, and now you've got a faster kernel and you've got a system that's got hardware um, optimization at the same time. So, I mean, that's a one-two punch to getting better optimization. Um, right, so basically touch that on the second slide. And one of the final problems is that a... Uh, P4 is not always a P4. Um, sometimes uh, it's got 
EMT64 in the later versions. You know, sometimes it's got SSA, SSE3. Uh, sometimes it has no HD. So what you'll see, you know, with Debian, you know, you see a, a Debian i386 build. Well, it's not an optimized kernel in the sense that it's going to be able to take uh, everything that the Prescott core can do. So, you know, the problem is, is what do we do? Do we, do we patch it so it runs on everything? Or do we do all these different distros? Or do we just leave it up to the person to recompile the stuff? And, yeah, that's usually what it is. Because, you know, they want to bring it out. They want to test it. They want to make it stable and, and have it run on everything, you know? I mean, that's, that's the idea, right? So in this situation, all of this stuff at the bottom kind of goes by the wayside uh, unless you do a recompile. So, you know, that's great, but what if you can't build a Gentoo system? What if you can't just compile everything specifically for it? And that's what I'm trying to get at with some of these advanced optimizations is because they for lack of a better analogy, can take a square peg, put it in a round hole. Um, and they get around the fact that you have to compile things generically. But they take out code, they take out other stuff that still optimizes the system. And in the end, you end up with a binary that you can redistribute. Um, and a lot of uh, mainstream applications out there, in fact, a lot of Windows applications out there have been forced do this to get the kind of uh, um, throughput that they need for their, their applications. And this is really, this is really the great part about open source, is that we can do this ourselves. We can open up another dimension of freedom that a lot of people don't think about when they have the code. They have the code and, okay, so I can compile it for my system. But what about for my personal usage? What about my own OS fingerprint? Is it there for what I use it for? Is it as fast as it possibly can? Um, and so uh, using these optimizations, IPO, especially PGO, we shape things for what we use them for, whether that's a desktop or a server or whatever we need to have that optimization for. What I've been talking about, IPO, interprocedural optimization, PGO, profile guided optimization, high end vectorization, high end math algorithms, optimized threading. Really won't get into any of the high end math algorithms or optimized threading. Um, high end vectorization, we'll talk about that some. So, interprocedural uh, optimization uh, is a little bit hard to grasp because it does a lot of different things. Um, but I think this breaks it down best. Is it's a heuristically based optimization scheme that can be implemented on entire programs, and that's with the IPO switch, uh, or on single files, and that's just a dash IP switch. Um, IPO can eliminate inefficient, wasted CPU, registers, SIMD units, and more. Uh, I want to call it garbage collecting for your compiler, but I don't know, something kind of like that. Um, Profile guided optimization. And this is probably the real interesting one because um, profile guided optimization is a two step process and it really is kind of like going to get fitted for a tux or a tailor for a nice occasion. Because you go in there, you make the suit, and then originally you have a suit. It's a very nice suit, but it's not a suit that's customized for you. And so what PGO does is it tailors it just like a tailor does. Um, and what it does is you've got a stage one and a stage two um, compile option. I was asked by one programmer, I was, he was saying like, well, what do they call the stage one and the stage two? What's the names for it? And I said, I think it's a stage one and a stage two. <laughs> that's all I know, that's all I've been calling it. But anyway, um, you have some different build flags for the first uh, PGO. Uh, make and you make uh, a binary that basically has the ability to analyze what's going on 
And so what you do is you bring up a, uh, something, you can bring up a game like Quake 3 and you put it through uh, its benchmark. And you want that benchmark to be faster, for instance. Well, it's creating how, it's creating some Dyn files on the fly while it's executing. So it's basically watching what's going on. Um, and then when you do the make, st uh, make stage two, uh, it's taking all those Dyn files, it's putting it into what's called a DPI file, and then it merges that. And with that information, it creates a binary that uh, basically is for what you're using it for. Um, and there are a lot of programs out there that are actually doing that this day, the, the, the squeak by. Uh, one thing I should mention, though, and why I mentioned the benchmark thing is that, yeah, it'll bake a benchmark. It'll make it look faster than it is. So if you really want to employ this, you want to make sure that it, well, if you're going to do it through benchmarks, you want to make sure that your benchmark is valid. Does it really mean anything to you? Um, you know, if you compile Firefox with PGO and all you do is open up a whole bunch of tabs and recompile it, yeah, you'll have a Firefox that's like that with fl tags, you know, I mean, tabs, so that's not what you want, right? You want a Firefox that's got faster uh, uh, JScript and JavaScript and all that kind of stuff. So basically, this goes through the phases. Uh, there it's got a little bit messed up on that. But anyway, um, the uh, first phase uses a flag called profgen. Um, that's what generates, uh, that gives it its ability to generate uh, the Dyn files. Um, you run that, it generates the Dyn files. Um, and then phase three is the final make, where uh, you use prof use and that's when you've got your shaped uh, executable binary that optimizes things how you want it. So I don't think a lot of people knew about this, but we actually had the fastest Firefox out there where we did PGO and IPO optimization. We still have the patches out there somewhere on Google Groups. And uh, I pick on Firefox because actually Windows had a uh, PGO and IPO optimized Firefox version that was faster than the window, the Linux version. Yeah, shame on us. That should never happen, right? So, um, the good thing is that the, the people, the good people at GCC have now seen the light and they've got PGO and IPO build into their builds. So now it's on par. Uh, as far as I know, it's still on par with what uh, Microsoft has. Obviously, Microsoft is more bloated, so it's going to be, you know, close. But this was done a while back by Lu Yi. He did the benchmarks on a Pentium M 1.7 gigahertz. Um, that's a pretty good difference uh, in JavaScript performance right there. Um, if you're expecting something that's, you know, you wake up the next morning in a mansion, somebody's serving you tea because you compiled, you know, your PGO just perfect. Don't expect that. It's not going to happen. This is something that's good for situations where um, you've got a CPU bound situation and you need it to go faster. It's good for clusters because, you know, if you get 5% on one cluster, well, if you've got 1,000 clusters, that's going to add up pretty quick, right? So that's a situation where it's a good idea to think about that. So vectorization, probably everybody here understands what vectorization is, I imagine. Um, everybody's heard of um, SSE, SSC4, all these different units out there, um, which um, actually started uh, back by Cray, well, it was popularized by Cray back in the 60s on their supercomputers, which they used it basically. Um, it's really what we use it for today is to optimize mm -hmm. loops and make them more parallel um, and give them to those coprocessors and uh, make everything happen at one time. Photoshop will do this for a file where you give it a blur. It'll say, okay, this is the data, this is the operation, boom, it's done. We did it all with, at one time with uh, single instruction, multiple data uh, coprocessors. In ICC, you'll see this when you're compiling something, you'll all of a sudden see something come out that says loop was vectorized. That's when you know that you've got some, 
code that's been evaluated and they said, well, you know what, we can take that and we're, we're gonna put that in a vectorized state. So there's some other stuff out there that you can use. Uh, there's a debugger. Um, there's vPro, which is a performance analy um, analyzation utility. I, I don't use it much, but it will find hot spots in your code. It's a little bit um, advanced debugging, but Intel, you know, they swear by it and think it's the greatest thing. Um, threading building blocks, you know, for parallelization and that kind of thing. Automatic parallelization is one of the big new features that uh, ICC and XC is pushing. Integrated performance primitives, math kernel library, we don't use that a whole lot. They're kind of in the background, they'll do their thing. So just some examples. Um, the good thing about uh, GCC versus ICC is that uh, it doesn't take a lot of crazy flags to do what you want. You know, you've got three or four in there that you're gonna use, and then it's gonna know what to do, and it's gonna create, it's gonna give you a uh, optimized output. Um, at the bottom, we've got the prof gen and the prof use, so in that case, we're using PGO, and in the bottom case, we're using IPO, and the first one generating a uh, uh, binary that's gonna do uh, dime files. Um, it's gonna be able to generate dot files, and then the second one's gonna say, oh, I've got some, compile them in, create an optimized uh, binary. So compiling the kernel um, is a little bit different. Um, and one of the reasons is uh, the kernel developers really love GCC and ICC understands GC, but not always. And that's why some stuff doesn't always compile. So um, we've got a guy in the middle who kind of plays referee, um, and it's the wrapper. And uh, he can translate semantics from GCC to ICC. Uh, he can add flags for specific optimizations. Um, but probably the most uh, useful thing, at least for us for debugging, is uh, filtering out non-compatible uh, flags uh, and uh, C files. We just give up on something, we put it in the wrapper, we'll say, you know what, it's not compiling, but I wanna see what else does. At the end, we submit that file to Intel and say, what is it, what's going on? Is it the compiler, is it the C? Because a lot of situations, you know, it can, it, there's a lot of turning wheels, you get a new ICC, or XE Composer build, then you get a new kernel build, and then you gotta test your old patch, and then you gotta find out what the problem is. Is it this, is it this, or is it this? So it's a never ending cycle to figure out what's going on. That's one of the main problems of, of keeping things up to date. All right, so Kernel commands uh, are pretty straightforward. If you're using the wrapper, what you wanna do is put this in the top. And what I usually do is I just take the wrapper, it's just a shell script, uh, and we've got them on the sites, and I just put it in user local bin, mark it as an executable, and then source it, uh, do a source EPC profile and find it. And um, basically do a make, uh, I think that should be a host CC at the front, I'm sorry host CC Intel wrapper, CC Intel wrapper, or whatever you want to call the wrapper. Um, and at the end of this, these are your linking. So Intel has libraries to link to instead of your G libraries, uh, your glib. And so these guys are, are fast. They're a little bit faster uh, in most situations, especially uh, if you're using IPO, uh, you want to link to that. Um, if you don't, you can try the second version. Now some of our patches, you see here I've used host CC, ICC, ICC. In this case our patch is built in where it's got the wrapper integrated and you don't have to use that. It doesn't need to translate it. We've got some uh, patches like 26341 that does not need the patch, does not need the wrapper. So you can use that in that kind of situation. Um, 
one thing that you'll notice when you first start making it is what have I just done to my system? What in the hell is all this crap that's coming on the screen? Because it doesn't look like GCC. You don't get like, okay, this is compile, this is compile, this is compile, this is compile. You get a lot of weird stuff happening on the screen and you're like, oh, should I turn off my screen? <laughs> should I turn off my system or what's going on? Just let it go. Um, it's very chanty, it's very pedantic, um, basically because it's taking the GCC file and it's like, oh God, I gotta take it out and get it right. So it finally compiles it and then you've got a perfectly good kernel as long as nothing uh, too bad that it can't handle um, blows up. But like I said, it's a process, it's a process. So we've just got some other uh, compile examples in here. This is how you get the uh, compiler to work. Once you've installed it, um, uh, you want to source what type of compiling you want to do. If you want to do 32-bit, you need to put in this string right here uh, that has IA32 at the end. If you want to do it with 64-bit, uh, it's Intel 64 at the end, not IA64 because that's for the Itanium boxes. A uh, little bit different there. So you can integrate it into Debian. Um, this uh, presentation is available on Linux DNA. I'll give you guys the link if you want it. Um, and it'll give you some basic examples of doing dev files, RPM files. That's basically what we have here. RPM, you know, just doing a little spec file, uh, other hacks. Gentoo. You know, I, I still think that it's the best way to go, and the reason is you start out with a simplified system, and then you build your way up. Um, if you start out with a Red Hat kernel and you patch it, things are not gonna go as smoothly as if you had a streamlined uh, pat, uh, kernel and you build your way up. It's just not gonna happen because they've got a lot of things. They've got a lot of extra patches that they've put in there. With RHEL 6, they're not telling you those patches anymore. You, you guys know why? It's a Oracle competition, the unbreakable Linux, that they're, um, they're a little bit pissed about the fact that they're taking it, this red hat, and they're calling it unbreakable. And I say, well, we could do that with CentOS. I yeah. see the unbreakable kernel does so well for the mainline. Really? It's got none of that in there? Did they change? Okay, are you with Oracle? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's good to know. I didn't know that because I've been told that the reason that they're doing that is because competition it's issues. Uh, okay, all right. Conspiracy theories. All right, but this is basically your make flag for Gen 2. Um, you just stick your ICC flags at the bottom. Um, now, not all of those are not gonna work, are gonna work. A lot of problems are gonna happen if you use IPO. Um, I would suggest using IP. Uh, IP is gonna do it on a per file basis where IPO is gonna take the whole uh, program. It'll take Firefox and just do IPO regression across the entire thing. So with that situation, there's one thing that you're gonna want is a lot of RAM because IPO takes a, makes a huge temp file to figure out what it can take in and take out and finally create that binary. So um, I needed eight gigs of RAM to do Firefox builds, so, or it would die. So, GCC breaks. It's not GCC's fault, it's ICC is trying to come in and take over. Um, the majority of the problems are the C ASM blocks. Um, GAS does not, code that compiles with GAS does not always compile with ICC's uh, compiler. It just doesn't always happen. Well, it, it's probably because it optimizes to that, is what I'm guessing. They've written it for the intrinsics that they know work with GCC. Um, we haven't really had the chance to 
get into it and figure out why. Because we, we haven't really come across a whole lot of situations where we've had to change that. But um, that is one of the main cases is the ASM just breaks, doesn't want to work. Um, three apps remain untamed. That would be GCC, Binutils, and G, uh, Glibc. You know, I don't even know if I want to try touching those because I don't want a black van coming in my house and taking me away for compiling something that I shouldn't have compiled. But anyway, um, the Itanium kernel and the SGI pro, uh, situation right now is epic. Anybody know why it's epic? Because it's the ex uh, explicitly parallel instruction set computing platform. Eh, that failed, didn't it? Okay, well, failed there. The project is, uh, it, it's a failure right now. We're still trying to figure out what's going on. We really need less than a supercomputer. We just need an itanium box that we can sit down and compile there on one CPU and get some minimal hardware on a Gen 2 system and get it up. Um, the uh, supercomputer is great, but We've got uh, Celeste, that's basically what we've been trying to build the most on, Red Hat, um, a little bit there, but it's just breaking, and um, we've tried, we've tried. I, I worked with Lu Yi for months on it, and we just kept on trying different things, we couldn't get it to work. So there's a lot of different changes in how things uh, are handled uh, versus the ICC for Itanium versus the x86 out there. So optimization campaign, if this is what we could do with the project, if we could devote the time uh, and energy, um, this is the kind of stuff that I'd like to see happen. Um, IPO and PGO pad sets for the latest vanilla kernels out there. Uh, I think that would be great. Uh, fully ICC's optimized system. We can almost do that. Uh, I mentioned that there's some stuff out there that we can't quite do. but. With a little tweaking, we can get pretty much of that done. Um, a fully PGO-aware system, that is, yeah, that's a little bit uh, of a vision right there. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. I'd love to see it happen, but it, that's a lot of work right there. PGO is very finicky. Uh, IPO is very finicky. So um, that's, that's issues there. The Migo ICC repos, once again, I'd love to do that. We need to get some more people involved. We need to get some more resources and, and have that happen. Um, if there's anybody out there that likes to be a maintainer that wants to tinker and try it out, I mean, you know, we're looking for, you know, a kernel and maybe Firefox, something that gets our name out there, lets, us, uh, lets people know that we're still out there trying to get stuff compiled. Um, Distro repos for RPM and dev-based systems. Basically, that's talking about um, Migo as it's RPM-based. Um, and, of course, the thing that would probably piss off Mr. Stallman the most is the diversification of other compilers with CLang and Sun compilers. Um, I think competition's good. I think that we're going to find more bugs if we hit it from different angles. All of these compilers are different. They all have strengths. Why don't we take the code that is open and find out all that we can find? Find out which one does what best with it. And I mean, I, I think that's that's like cross training for basketball. I mean, it's just going to do something that's going to do it's going to end up with a better kernel in that situation. So. Uh, in closing, XE and ICC proves the power of open source. Um, you can't do this with closed source software unless you want to go to jail um, because you don't have the ability to look at it to recompile it and then customize it for yourself. They're just not going to let you do that. Um, and in the end, this is going to give you meaningful, holistic results. It's going to give you a faster system. And that's just in in game right there. So, in my opinion, uh, GPC computing does not cut it. I hate looking at these gigantic systems that do nothing all day in a data center. They're wasting electricity. They're wasting space. We could get some kind of infrastructure in there that streamlines that, cuts down electricity costs, gets things running the way they should be. Um, 
it's just I don't like the idea. Um, I think the other one is cheaper and more capable. Again, Lu Yi, he's been one of the biggest compu uh, uh, contributors to the project. Uh, I can't do it without him. I uh, wish I could talk to him more, but you know, being in uh, Shanghai does not make it easy. Uh, Fei Long Wong, he's the guy I work with the most at Intel. He's been great for giving us resources and making sure that we have all the questions that we need answered. Um, and then there's SGI for everything they've done. She's done a lot of things with 32-bit patches. If you need 32-bit patches, he's a guy to talk to. And of course, there's a lot of other guys out there in the group that I gotta say hi to, uh, say hello and thank you to. Um, and Red Hat also for giving us the new RHEL 6 that we're starting to work on also. So we are a very small unpaid project. So for us to do what we do, we need contributions, we need extra people involved. Um, please contribute to us if you can. Um, we'd love to hear what you think we can do. Contribute, contribution doesn't mean cash necessarily, it means your opinion, it means what would you do, it means can I jump in and try this and see what people think, kind of a situation. Oh my gosh, another blue screen. I guess it's time to go to the bar. Shoot. Any questions? Yes, it does. Can I answer that one at the bar? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, to be, um, yes, AMD does, and AMD will create, you can, you can, ICC does for AMD, it will create good code um, in its original in form, probably not the same code that you would get out of uh, an Intel, a genuine Intel platform. Um, you know, being in capitalism, you've got competition and sometimes you pull things that put it in favor of you selling hardware. Um, I, I didn't know about that when I first started the project, but there's some situations. However, there's some patches out there. I don't know where, unless they hit me at the bar, where uh, <laughs> they get around that, and they get around that legally. There's some patches out there that don't do it legally, and I don't suggest those, definitely, because AMD is not a sponsor. So anyway, um, <laughs> but yes, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Um, two, three, six, um, two, three, seven will compile. It's still got some problems. Truth be told, 236 is still in beta. Um, we've got some new RHEL 6 patches that we just added to the, uh, uh, to the site. And um, I have a lot of hopes for those because that's gonna have a more stable base where we're gonna be able to try some of those optimizations a little bit easier, you know. I don't try to get, uh, there, there's a lot of politics upstream, right? Um, and I, I try not to get involved with that. So what I do is I give my patches and all our, our problems straight to Intel. And uh, Intel has OSTC um, and they submit upstream. Because Intel is, is one of the biggest providers really of code for the, for the kernel right now. They, I, I don't know, I mean, they're top six or something like that. I don't know how much they, they produce, but it, it's quite a lot. A lot of paid developers for them. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we'll get new um, versions of ICC and we'll have nothing wrong with our patches, the same old kernel, and then we run ICC and it doesn't work. And it's just kind of like, oh, well, there is a, a regression in ICC, it needs to be fixed. And then, you know, next version, it's fixed. So, yeah, it's a constant cycle of trying to figure out what's working and what's not working. It's usually very stable. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Um, there are situations where you can compile something and all of a sudden it just gets quirky and you have to figure out what it is. A lot of situations you can change the build flags to figure out what's going on. 
Um, PGO is an example of that. The original patches uh, were built for single core systems. And in PGO, you've got that first um, patch that injects actually some proprietary information from Intel. It's a non-redistributable kernel at that point. And you have a uh, module, that's the module, and then you have a daemon. It's called uh, PGOD, I call it PGOD, because I think that sounds better. But anyway, that collects all the dynary, uh, uh, the dyn files and all that kind of stuff. That scenario works great on a single core system or a system where you've got all the other cores, but the first one turned off. So if you add more cores, you get into a problem with cache coherency, and those dyn files get corrupted, and then your final thing that pops out is like a burnt you know, Christmas turkey. It's not what you were looking for. Did I answer your question? Any more questions? I have one you may not hear the answer. Uh, do, you, do you know whether or not uh, IBM simulator register for antivirus? Uses the what register? Simulator register. I have no idea. That was something I could ask uh, Fei Long at uh, Intel, though, yeah. for you. Send me an uh, email, tyler at linuxdna.com, and I'll send it to him. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, anybody who uh, bought great tickets, lunch is in the alcove to the left. And if you want to eat in the restaurant over here, make sure you stay until the top of the so we can get off floor. So the lunch is this way. What about this? I can help with I like it. it. Help we have the same problem. What would happen if you did I this? You gave me a I good found idea. a problem. How do you do that? that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with it. Really? Who would have thought of that? Let's put the word out. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS. HP.